This programme features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Sunrise Safari. We are coming to you live at the moment from the Mara Triangle in Kenya, where it is a beautiful 29 degrees Celsius, 81 degrees Fahrenheit. And I have swapped out with Pat and Lauren. They've gone on leave back down to South Africa. And, well, I am here now with, Ch uh, with Archie on camera. And what a wonderful afternoon it is. Don't forget, everybody, we are live. It's active. We'd love to hear from you. Send your questions, comments to hashtag Safari Live or throw them in on the YouTube chat stream. But what a way to start the afternoon then with some of the beautiful giants of the Mara. Probably a big female there with her two offspring. And they are thoroughly enjoying the very long grass on these nutrient-rich soils. I've yet to pass a wildebeest. Uh, Archie assures me he saw three a couple days ago, which means the migration has arrived. I'm only joking. <laughs> Three wildebeest is probably guys who decided not to um, not to undertake the enormous journey all the way south to come back again. And uh, before the migration returns, these elephants are all going to enjoy themselves out here on the open plains because apparently when the migration returns, the noises and the sounds created and probably also the smells of the millions of animals forces the elephants to move elsewhere. I'm not sure exactly where they go, but uh, there are hundreds of them around on the open plains at the moment. And I think they're making hay while the sun shines. Beautiful, beautiful cow there. Being photobombed by her, seems to be daughter. It's hard to tell when they're this age, male and female. Especially when the grass is all the way up to their bellies. So you're all enjoying the elephants, everybody? Well, it's wonderful to be able to see elephants. And in the Mara, they are a plenty at the moment. Uh, we also had a very big herd of buffalo not so long ago. I know we don't get to see that many buffalo down in Juma at the moment. So we were going to stay with them for a little while, but we've been on the search for the Aweno Pride. It's a Pride Alliance I'd like to spend some time with while I'm here. And we're also going to be looking for where the North Clan might be. We've been searching for the last two hours, but haven't been able to find any signs of the Aweno Pride. You can see just in the background at the top, in the background there, the very green vegetation up below the escarpment. Uh, that huge block there is where there's been a big controlled fire put through. And that whole area is an area that I was very, very fortunate to spend some time with the Aweno Pride. And there we go, you can see the extent of it. It's not the biggest block in the world. We haven't covered all of it. We've covered probably about to there, and then we came back down the mountain. Um, but there's a big herd of buffalo in there. There were lots of topi and also hartebeest, all enjoying, and zebra, of course, enjoying the very fresh green grass as the animals are also still waiting for more rain. There was a bit of rain the other day that nearly washed David away, but apparently it's late, and apparently it's been very limited so far. Sharon, you want to know if I'm happy to be in the Mara? Of course I am. Apart from the fact that there's a bit of a glare coming through onto my face right now while I look at you, it is a wonderful wonderful place to be. Um, just these open spaces. I've swapped my smaller office down in South Africa to a much bigger office out here. And uh, almost, um, well, there's been a few little moments today on the roads where there's some mud wallows and some puddles. I've been taking it very slowly, trying to navigate them because I don't want to get stuck. I know a lot of you are going to be watching to see if I do get stuck. Uh, Archie probably thinks it's going to happen anyway. Oh, don't you, Arch? Yeah, he gives a thumbs up. He thinks I'm going to get stuck, but we're going to try. I'm here for about two and a half weeks. We're going to try the best we can to find as much action as we possibly can and also to try and not get stuck. But the North Clan has moved, apparently. I don't know exactly where it is. Uh, Archie says he knows it's close to Serena Estrip that a portion of the clan has moved. So we're going to spend some time over the next two weeks really, really trying to go around, find the Aweno Pride, spend some time with the hyenas of the North Clan and just see how the dynamics have shifted since I was last year. I left in December and, uh, well, the vegetation's changed. The grass is far taller 
And, well, of course, there's absolutely no wildebeest anywhere. But anyway, we're going to move on from these elephants and continue on the missions that we have detailed. And in the meantime, let's go back down to South Africa with my good friend, Trishala. Ah, oh, Steve, how nice to have you up in the Mara and be able to link to you over there. Well, my name is Trishala and I've got Senzo on camera with me and I have a very bright sun in my eyes and out looking for the lions. So I'm at the right place at the moment and it should be very, very close to me. So as soon as we get to those lions, I'm going to be really excited to see who we've got and whether those males will come and interrupt them again, which would be really, really nice to watch. Like, you know, we're coming to you from Juma Private Game Reserve in the Sabi Sands in the Greater Kruger National Park. So exciting things. I think it's quite hot today. It's about 30 degrees Celsius and 86 degrees Fahrenheit. So it is quite hot, but I do enjoy the heat. And I'm also going to keep a keen eye out for Tandi because she was also seen around where her kill was recently. And of course, watering holes. Because of the heat, it's always a good bet. Especially now that it's drying up. When it was, when we were getting quite a bit more rainfall in like spring, summer time. Even on hot days like this, it would be quite difficult to find animals because they will still, they will still go to smaller sort of pans that collect so that water is spread more. So you can't just go to the place you know there's a concentration of water and hopefully there would be animals at. So now that it's drying up, we at least know, okay, there's certain places that, are gonna, that is going to have water, and that is where we'll go. So I'm going to check out Twin Dams now. I'm sure you all are familiar with it. It's down south, and then we'll go up a little bit further to the lions. Looking out for any little creatures as well. I'm quite excited to find a maybe maybe a chameleon maybe a chameleon challenge coming to bin but that'll be later on when it's slightly darker actually you can have a look here look at this pan on our left and you can see it's really really dry but you can see that water was once there and there was a time when it was kind of full and there used to be a few rhino that used to chill out in this little pan but now things are drying up. You can see, totally cracked. So where we're going to go now, we'll have a bit more water. So let's head down there. I think I, think I should definitely challenge Ben. I'll do that later when he... <laughs> when he introduces himself. So I am out here with Ben and Ben's gonna be taking sort of the north, go through to Bifelsuk Dam, Gadigal Pan, see we're all checking those watering holes. And then I will check down south here, catch up with the lions and then hopefully also go to the high den. I haven't seen my hyenas in quite a while. So I am good to that. Especially Plonk. There seems to be two different dens. I don't mind visiting one set and then going and visiting the other set. I've been just too spoiled with lions and leopards that I couldn't actually give my hyenas any attention. Just quite sad actually, which is why I think they deserve some attention today. They do. Today's a little bit of history and I'm sure Ben can tell you a little bit more about that when he gets up and running. And that is in 1990 on this day, the Hubble telescope was launched on the Discovery STS-31. And it's important because the, the Hubble telescope gave us so much in terms of research of the universe, including things like the age of the universe. It assisted scientists a lot in determining that sort of thing as well as some asteroids, I think, some new comets. It was just, it's an incredible feat to have that up in, in space for that long. Be 19 years. I'm sure you all know Ben is quite the stargazer and he's brought his telescope along with us, well, along with him. 
Ramona, you'd like to know if Juma will be getting any more rain soon. It is entering our dry season, so there will be a little bit of rain. How much in terms of millimeters, I'm not sure, but it will be it is definitely not the rainy season. In fact, it will be the dry season. We don't really get very hot or very cold periods. We more get dry and wet seasons. So on Sunday, there was a little bit of rain, but I say a little bit because it must have rained for about 20 minutes and that's it. Oh, I always like this little turn because there's all these big trees on either side of me. Oh, let's see what, what goes down here. Do we have a showdown? Is it a match? Oh. So this is two males, or these are two males that are obviously got a bit of a dispute going over territory. Oh, there's a third younger one coming out the side. Two younger ones. So these guys, they're probably in a little bit of a bachelor herd. If it, if it was a territorial ram, we would not tolerate them around like this. But it looks like these are the guys that are left over. Haven't found themselves a space yet, but that's okay because it'll take just a matter of time, not even a few weeks, for the rams that currently have territories to become slightly worsened in condition. And that's when these guys who are fresh will be able to... Oh, look at him. He's rubbing that gland on his forehead onto those, onto that bit of tree there. So they'll still be doing all this sort of practice. Still be practice sparring when they're together, even though they don't have a territory yet. Ah, oh, there you go. Let the ladies know. Does look like he's just getting a good itch, but he is definitely rubbing that gland on there. Now, at the peak of the rut, their territories can last only about eight days, which I find really amazing because that means that those rams that are territorial are losing condition in eight days, just due to the, due to the fact that it's taking so much out of them to be able to actually maintain and keep this territory that within eight days their condition is completely deteriorated and a new set is ready to take over. I'm just going to pop up onto the damn wall and we'll see if there's anybody by the water. Oh, hello. We've all moved up here now. Just let's just watch him for a second. Maybe you can hear him. <laughs> Did you hear that? <laughs> well, these rams can be really, really off the rocker sometimes when they get a bit crazy during this time of year. It's quite entertaining to watch. Anyway, someone else is entertaining to watch. Ben is finally out and about, so let's go to him to say hello. Good afternoon everybody, welcome to the Sunset Drive. Um, my name is Ben, on camera with me I've got Craig and this afternoon we are going to hopefully follow up on the beautiful Tundi who was seen this morning. Uh, I think Trishana is probably going to be heading towards the lions that we had a little bit earlier today. Um, and Tundi was last seen going north from Chele Pan and those of, you, those of you who have been following the show for the last couple of days we'll know we've uh, we're hoping that she is very pregnant and we're wondering just maybe maybe she's going to lead us to a den site last time we saw her she did still look quite rotund in the belly so we don't think she's had them just yet but uh, it does she's been spending a lot of time in that Mawati drainage line system on the eastern side of our property that runs south from Buffalo Dam so we are hoping that she's going to find a nice uh, safe but accessible to us uh, place to have her cubs hopefully in the next week or two or maybe sooner if we're if, if we're very very lucky uh, I believe that's also where she was born as a cub um, 
so it, it's quite normal for leopards to go back to the same den site repeatedly, uh, especially if she was born there, because she associates that with a safe place. Other than that, we are going to drive around and see what else we can find. It has been very warm today, although the clouds have just given us a moment's bit of relief. Uh, so we'll be checking some of the water holes and see if we can find some, uh, some any activity there, maybe some nice birds. We might swing past and see what Snorkel Steve and, uh, sorry, Scuba Steve and Snorkel Sally are up to. Um, although as they're terrible name nickname has as the most boring hippos in the sabi sands which is a bit harsh i think um, but maybe they surprise us with uh, doing some dancing and wearing tutus like something out of fantasia this afternoon but we will see uh, in the meantime we're just enjoying this lovely vista uh, and seeing what we can see i think you've had some impalas with trish this morning well, we've just found one male on our left he's actually got a lovely set of horns so i'm going to stop and appreciate him for a moment look at those beautiful horns you can see how widely spaced they are and the fact that he's on his own is also important this time of the year i believe trishala was just explaining to you that it is rutting season and that the males are establishing their territories and fighting one another for dominance and for mating rights uh, a lot of people often question at this time of year why we see individual impalas and they're normally in herds or a group of impalas is known as a rank of impalas um, but you can see from the uh, the size of this male's horns he's a he's a big guy and he's obviously been successful uh, in one of these initial rutting fights and he has now established a territory in this area which he is going to mark by using a midden which is basically a big pile of poo because his when he defecates and urinates all of his hormonal information will be contained within that and give information to any other male who who dares step foot into his territory is able to find out uh, all about this guy and how old he is and how strong he is and all of that but only species specific information it's almost like having a computer program and having the wrong uh, software or the wrong drivers so if a kudu came along and sniffed um, an impala's midden it would just smell like impala poo but another impala will be able to extract all of that specific information about this individual but as you can see, we're back on quarantine here, so quite close to camp, so it's nice and open. He's got access to water close by, so perfect territory. Okay, well, whilst we sit here and see what this guy's doing, at the moment he seems to be just enjoying the shade under a tree. Let's send you back up to the Mara and to Steve and see what's happening that side. Well... How interesting is that, that Tandy might potentially be pregnant? It has been a topic of talking for some time now. And I think Tristan, I mean, last night he was spending a bit of time trying to find her. How interesting would it be if she does have another little youngster right there in the middle of Juma? Very exciting times. We had such wonderful times with Columba last year and Tandy. They were just five minutes from camp five minutes you could be in a beautiful leopard sighting with a mum and a cub and i think i'm on a road archie am i on a road here looks like i'm on a road everything out here disappears from time to time so we kind of in the area of the old no, this is definitely definitely not a road this has turned into probably it's just a sighting road at some point let's just go back there to where it turned Ooh, don't want to fall in that. We've just been, Archie's just been showing me images of of when Pat and Lauren got stuck in a very, very big mud wallow. And um, I was wondering why he never shared the images before, because, wow, <laughs> they're properly, properly stuck. The story goes that uh, Archie and Pat got stuck, and um, Bunge and Lauren came to, or oh, Manu, was it Manu and Lauren came to pull them out? And they pulled them out, and after they'd pulled them out, they ended up driving into, them, <laughs> into it themselves. <laughs> so the image is showing a Land Rover that just disappeared into the hole in the ground. Really, really funny. I'm laughing, but it is funny. And if I do get stuck, I do know all of you are going to laugh, and I'm going to accept it. Because if we can't laugh at ourselves, who can we laugh at? Like that Hukumori video, I still find it hilarious. 
hilarious indeed. See, that's a much better looking pathway. That was just a little bit of a veering off to the left. But um, a lot of the roads that I remember from last time, they've kind of just gone completely overgrown. Hello, Lioness. Well, this is my fourth time here. And uh, one of my bucket list things is to see a proper hyena battle, um, hyenas versus hyenas. That's something I've never really encountered. I've heard it and I've seen videos and stuff, but I've never been part of that. And then also to experience a clan of hyenas come in and tackle a pride of lions. I thought it was going to happen last year with the Wino pride. I was in a sighting with them. Uh, they killed the wildebeest. They possibly killed two, the North clan. It might have even been the Happy Zebra clan. I'm not sure. Uh, but they came in and just pushed the lions off. It was a very poor show from the Owinos, but the Owinos have only got, at the time, two adults and three youngsters. So that's something I'm really looking forward to seeing, is um, a big sort of clash of the titans of the Mara. Of course, um, the titans really are the elephants and the black rhino, but that'd be nice to see what Scott saw last year, that beautiful sighting of uh, the elephants and the rhino chasing their wino pride. Really special stuff. And here are some more, some more elephant. Beck cheetah would be fantastic to see. Indeed, um, I'm spending a bit of time this afternoon trying to get my bearings again. Uh, but what we do know of where, let's just frame up these elephants for you, Archie. Some beautiful herds moving through. What we do know of is that the cheetah are often seen quite far to the south, sort of on the boundary, on the border with Tanzania. And they do move through. They don't spend an enormous amount of time in the same place, but I know that uh, Pat did have some luck uh, with cheetah when he was here, as did Lauren. So catching up and following up with some of them will be fantastic. Uh, we do have a couple WhatsApp groups up here that enable us to share sightings. And unfortunately, the internet is not working on this vehicle today. So I can't catch up with the other vehicles and find out exactly who or where or what they've seen. So for now, we're just going to bumble around, see if we can find um, the North Clan's new den site. We have been working for two hours or so trying to find the Aweeno Pride. But well, they'll pop out. They'll pop out when they're ready. But Archie says the last time he saw them is actually quite close to where we're headed now. So who knows? I mean, the dynamics of the lion prides and their territories are, are shifting and changing, all to do with the abundance of food. Rosemary, well, I'm going to go and check out that Batted Fox Den, most certainly. I haven't heard anything about it since I left. I think Tristan spent a bit of time, and since then I don't think I've heard too much about the den that is that was there, or probably it's probably moved, if anything. Those youngsters are definitely grown up. But we were very fortunate to have that time just on the side of the road next to us there with that little family. Very, very special indeed. But some very awesome shots out here in the Mara Triangle of enormous open spaces. It sounds like some form of Franklin there. Almost sounds like a Koki Franklin to me. You do get Kokis up here. It's not sound sounding as high pitched as in Juma. Maybe the acoustics are a little bit different from that down up here because uh, much more open spaces doesn't have the same sort of trees to reverberate off but for the moment the sky is cloudy but doesn't look like there's any thunder showers on the horizon but they can happen so quickly out here you can turn your back and next thing there's one upon you but magnificent scenes when you are huh? that looks like one building down in the south in fact now that i've done a full 360. There seems to be one building all the way down there. I was standing with Manu outside my tent last night and I was watching that electric storm from the south that was really thrashing down. Everyone is saying beautiful scenes. They are indeed. It's nice to be able to switch up locations and to be able to see uh, new environments. And every now and again, you stop the car, scan left or right with the binoculars, look for some shade. 
There potentially might be a pride of lions lying underneath. But it is still a warm afternoon. I suppose we'll have to wait for it to cool down a little bit. But we're going to head off towards where Archie tells me that the hyena den is. And depending on whether they're there or not, we might make a turn past the Mara River and show you what the last few days of rain has done to the flowing waters. From the air, it did look a little bit better than I've been shown of late. There we go. The elephant are dropping some compost on the floor as they continue to eat their never-ending appetites. We're going to go down to Juma once again with Trishala, who's on the search for who knows what, but I wish her luck. Trishala is busy, very slowly creeping down the road looking for lions. Now, I saw some tracks coming out of the the block that they were in this morning, which is not very helpful. I was hoping they would be in the same spot. It looks they've definitely moved. Man. Okay, so what we're going to do, I saw, the tracks looked like they were going into this block on my left. So what I'm probably going to do is do a little bit of a around the block, drive around the block and see if there are any tracks coming out of the block on other sides that will tell me they're either here or they're not here, then I can go in and search the block. It's also really hot, so they'll be totally flat on the ground. Also saw some baboons down here, so I'm hoping we can catch up with them. Oh, hello, Mr. Hornbull. I almost got killed by a hornbull today, by the way. I walked through a sort of passageway where there's the gate on one side and a wall on the other side. And just as I came out, a hornbull flew this close to my nose, shoop, right past me. Can you imagine if that beak ended up with me? There we go. Hello, friends. We've got some baboon friends here. Doing a bit of foraging shame in the dryness of the grass. It's not going to be very, very helpful. Now, as you probably know, they've been causing a lot of trouble around camp, pulling Tristan's door often. Lioness, you'd like to know if it's a concern that it's already this dry. Um, it's not a concern. It's, it happens. It's almost as if it's progressively gotten drier as the years go on. So it's, I mean, it's not dire, but it's definitely not ideal. I read something really interesting today about climate change and now having these hotter hotter periods in the day and lots of animals hunt as like for example a wild dog hunts in a pack and when you hunt in a pack you dedicate a lot more time to this hunt and when you have really hot days or hotter portions in the day and then you're, you're lessening your time that you can actually hunt so there's all these indirect effects to these hot dry days certain animals may not even be able to feed themselves because the prey species that they usually target never too late you'd like to know if baboons migrate in winter they do not migrate in winter in fact they'll sometimes they will definitely move around quite a bit and when they do they have sort of home ranges, they're not really territorial. So what they tend to do is they come across another troop. They'll sort of avoid the other troop. Um, and you'll find if there's females that are sort of trying to communicate with members of the other troop, the alpha male kind of gets in between them and says, no, 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 you come this side. You're part of my, you're my girlfriend. You're in my group. Very interesting. What are you eating there? Picking off the tree and eating something. 
I do find them quite cute. I don't think that they... that they really get... Hey. <laughs> that they really get the credit they deserve because a lot of the time they do cause a lot of trouble and they can be quite a nuisance. Apart from that, they're also very, very strong. And if you've seen in the tent, we have a skull, a baboon skull. And if you look at those canines, they are massive. Ah, oh, isn't that beautiful? What a lovely silhouette of this guy eating. Now we are right near where the lions were. Rosalind, you'd like to know why, hy uh, why hyenas, why baboons have red bottoms? Well, a lot of the time it's more of a, it's sort of a callus in a way. And you'll find that you, the male baboons can tell whether the female is receptive or whether it's her time of the month to be receptive based on the coloration of that bulbous, um, callous like bottom that they have and when it gets really nice and red then he'll know that they she is ready to be mated with or rather it's the peak in her cycle so the most she's most likely to conceive around that time so that's the main use of it apart from that it also offers a nice cushiony seat oh somebody is nice and close to us They're very silent, I must say. It's actually quite surprising. And they, they, each of them are foraging. They're all eating and picking and things, but they're quite quiet. It's a very soft sound. I'm not sure if you'll be able to hear it. There are some babies around as well. We saw them scatter earlier. It's very silent. It's very soft, which I find so surprising considering how they uh, seem to be so destructive. Apart from destructive, they also know how to play pranks like they did on Sydney not too long ago. <laughs> well, the fact that they are they are here um, is kind of reinforcing the idea that the lions have moved slightly because we are literally very, very close. Ah, oh, Freddy, just as I was discussing. I'm just trying to watch them as well because they seem to be fairly rela relaxed and you'll always find that when animals start to forage again, even if you do disturb them at first, because obviously you're coming in um, and they can see you and they can hear you, but once they return back to normal behavior, it tells me that they're quite comfortable. They're making a few noises and walking off, but... The fact that they're here, Freddy, tells me that maybe the lions have moved. Nevertheless, we still will be searching for them. Very cool. Now, I quite like baboons and I haven't been able to actually spend enough time with them recently. And they're quite similar to hyenas, believe it or not. So I'm interested in them. Anyway, let us keep on our search for the lions. In the meantime, let me send you over to Ben, who's on a search for another big cat. Hello, everybody. Right, we are in the Mawati drainage line at the moment, which is very close to where we last had Tundi this morning. She was just south of us. I've just come in from Chele Pan. I know we did say I was going to go up to Bufalsuk Dam, but we had a, a slight issue that meant I had to shoot back to camp quickly, so changed my plans. Um, and it, as I said earlier, it is very, very warm here. So if I was a leopard, I would be lying up somewhere in this drainage line system, staying out of this baking African sun. So I haven't found any tracks yet, but one assumes that she's not going to go too far. She's got water there by Chele Pan, although the lions were quite close to it this morning. Um, but if uh, I believe Trish is with some baboons somewhere close to that, so maybe they have moved on. 
Uh, but we are just having a little scan in these thickets as we go and see if we can find any evidence as to where she might have gone. But so far, nothing yet. But it's always beautiful to drive up these drainage lines. These are like little animal highways during the, the heat of the day. Uh, Becky, you're asking about uh, Tundi and her pregnancy status. Well, I can't tell you with 110% certainty that she's pregnant. I haven't personally seen her, but I know when Tristan saw her the other day, he was commenting on how rounded her belly was looking. Uh, and it was about three months ago that she was seen mating with the Duke, with Tingana, our resident dominant male leopard. So there is a very good possibility that if that conception was successful, that uh, now would be around about the right time where she should start start to show, and then potentially within a week or, or a few weeks from whoop, a few weeks from now, and then we might be fortunate enough to have some little tiny ba baby leopards which would be of course absolutely amazing so i can't tell you with 110 percent certainty but we are certainly hoping that that is the case uh, obviously what we really want to be to do is to find her soon not looking so fat uh, no no offense intended to her of course um, which might suggest that she has given birth and then we will be paying particular attention to her mammary glands because if she does have cubs we should see some fairly obvious signs that she has been suckling. Uh, we'll see the, the hair being matted in the area, well I should say down here as a cat. Um, and often we all see sort of this, the hair around there become saturated and some of the hair comes out because the, the pups are, sorry, the cubs are busy suckling. Uh, Francis, you're asking about the gestation period of leopards. Well, of course, it's going to be dependent upon a, a few factors in terms of available food and whatnot and how fast the development can take place. But on average for leopards, we, we go with a figure of about 100 days, so just over three months. So three months and a little bit. Uh, and that's normal for the cats. It's quite a short gestation period. Lions is only about 110 days. Hyenas is somewhere between sort of 90 to 100 days. And that is uh, probably an adaptation because these animals are hunting animals and they need to sprint quickly and potentially get into confrontation with antelopes so they need to be fast so they can't run around with lots and lots of embryos in their tummy. Okay, but while we continue our search for Tundi, I'm gonna send you back up to the Mara to Steve, who I believe has got a smaller little predator to show you. Thanks, Ben. You know, well, we can all think and we can all assume that Tandy might be pregnant. I mean, Tristan is probably the one about, amongst us who knows best. Well, exciting news nonetheless. But everybody, how nice is this? <clears throat> we pulled over, excuse me, on the side of the road. Have a look at some topi and some zebra. And I was just scanning the shade and the shadows. And we found a pair of blackback jackal. Well, I'm going to say they're blackback jackal. They might be side striped. But I only remember seeing black-backed while I was up here last time. Remember, we also found a den of black-backed jackal close to the den site of the um, bat-head fox. So it's a good start. I know some of you out there are thoroughly excited every time we find jackal. And here are the topi we were talking about. Beautiful, beautiful animals. They are really, really gorgeous. And of course, always a zebra or two. This zebra is a bit confused on his own. I'm assuming he is on his own because, um, you know, normally you find males alone. Females quite quickly get snatched up into a herd. Uh, if they leave their natal herd, it's generally by being pulled away by a male. So you don't often find females heading off on their own. So it seems like many of you viewers are getting quite confused or perplexed that I am up in the Masai Mara. Well, it's not an impossible feat. It just requires a couple, well, this time only one plane, uh, Kenyan Airways, to get you. A bit of a late flight and a late day and a long day yesterday, but I've been here since about midday yesterday, and then I just slept all of the rest of the afternoon just to catch up on sleep because it was a pretty much an all-nighter. Um, but anyway, I know a lot of these animals probably know what it feels like to take or have an all-nighter. 
They're living out here with predators around. And there are some sounds of impala ratting off in the distance. Not something I've experienced here in the Mara. And after discussion with David last time I was here, there's no set peak season um, for the ratting up in the Mara. They generally will sort of around two periods, uh, the long rains and the short rains, uh, but invariably they can uh, rat or mate at any time. Not like the, the impala down in South Africa that are coming into their rut right now. Jonathan, from a weight point of view, I'm not 100% sure, but their horns are incredibly big, and I'm sure a lot of it's got to do with the diet. Uh, even in South Africa, impala species or kudu species that grow in a different area where the soil is different, there's a different nutrient. Uh, I think phosphorus is the nutrient. I'm not 100% sure. It could be potassium, but one of those nutrients in the soil actually... Sorry, can you have a look at this um, topi coming at the back there? He's getting a little bit a little bit funny with all of the others around him. He's nodding his head. One that's coming just from the left now. You'll see him. There he is. He's getting very excited. He's walked into this herd, telling them all who's boss. But uh, it's sort of nutrients in the soil, certain minerals that encourage horn growth and also uh, tusk growth. Some of it's genetic. Oh, he's definitely interested in something. Hello. There's definitely a herd of topi. And likewise, they also have sort of a bimodal peak in their breeding. They don't have a set peak like we do in South Africa. And it's all got to do with evolutionary purposes around when the rain falls. <laughs> See how excited he is? He's probably trying to either chase some females or to push some males away. Look at him. Yep, there's definitely an interest there. couple youngsters lying around in the grass from last season's birth. Oh, here comes a male from the right. He's going to challenge. Here he comes. He's like, who do you think you are coming into my harem over here? Let's see what happens, everybody. See if the other male will run. They might go behind the car, which will make it difficult. He's, see, it's all body language. The one on the left now, obviously, was being a little bit cheeky and tried to sneak into an area that this guy has clearly established. And, well, quite often, Topi, are, they leave each other alone just through posturing. Quite often stand on top of what, their little mounds and look at each other, and then they know who's bigger. But every now and again, I suppose the pheromones encourage them in. Or he looked from a distance and saw that this guy was maybe busy, but he's chased him. They don't have very big areas. The sort of arenas or the leks they have can be quite small, in fact. So he's obviously come to the edge and gone, OK, you're out now. Back to my ladies. Hello, Becky. Jackal, the closest relatives to Jackal? Well, they're all in the dog family. So Jackal, Sidestripe Jackal, Blackback Jackal, um, Bat-Eared Fox, they're quite similar. There's a lot of differences between them, um, but they're all part of the small canine family, even wild dog, Ethiopian wolf, a number of them around in the world. But um, I'll double-check for you. The closest, I'd say the closest is the Sidestripe Jackal and then the... Um, what was I going to say? The bat-eared fox. But I'll have a look at the, the family grouping in my wonderful book. And uh, it often gives you an idea of all of the ones that are in there. And they have some similar traits. There's also golden jackal I've never seen before. They're right up in the north of Africa. The bat-eared fox is in there as well, which I dealt with a lot last time I was here. What else have we got? There's another... Lots of dogs, lots and lots of dogs. So foxes, jackals and dogs. We've got the um, sand fox, the fennec fox, Rupel's fox, cape fox, which we find down right down in South Africa in the Cape area, batted fox, of course. And then obviously all the canids being golden jackal, black back jackal, side striped, and then simian, which I've never, never seen before. They're obviously quite north as well. And then the wild dog forms into that family as well but obviously lots of similarities but then the differences in their habitat are quite often uh, the habitat and the diet choice are quite often what separates them hello lioness you want to know why we don't see many more jackal down south well leopards like to eat jackal i've seen a couple leopards eating jackal they really really do enjoy jackal 
Um, the predator numbers there, maybe there's not as much scavenging to be done. Uh, we don't have the lions feeding that often on Druma itself, uh, so it doesn't really provide that much in the way of, of food for the jackal. Um, out here, we've got these open grassland plains. Uh, there's plenty of rodents, plenty of small mammals and birds for the jackal to feed on, which gives them a lot more in the way of diet. Down south, oh, there's the topi again chasing each other. It's on, everybody. They are very far. Oh, hang on, he's given up. Oh, that's a youngster following. I think maybe there was a male who's interested and she said no. Okay. There's lots of lots going on. There we go. There's the male at the back. You can clearly see him with his head up, can't you? He's much bigger. He's probably interested in the females. They might be coming back into estrus again. Their calves are looking pretty well established in the herd. It's possible there's all sorts of pheromones being being dealt out there and it's going to cause all sorts of <laughs> all sorts of issues with these boys and they can't really think of anything else when the pheromones are in the air but down in south africa i mean in the kruger national park there's quite healthy populations of jackal um in druma i think a lot of it's just got to do with the habitat um, the jackal is needs a little bit of open space. They are a very quick and agile animal, but they get snuck up upon all the time by a leopard. And so I think that that is probably a reason why we don't see as many of them there. But in most of the Kruger, generally there's quite a hot, uh, quite a sort of happy or healthy population of black-backed jackal feeding on all sorts of diets from, from uh, birds to small mammals and also then scavenging off of the kills of large predators. I mean, it's the same. We don't see vultures every day in Juma, do we? Uh, vultures and jackal go quite hand in hand um, around the place when it comes to scavenging. And uh, if we saw more vultures in Juma itself, we'd probably see more jackal as well because they both attract each other towards kills, towards carcasses. And I've actually seen a jackal catch a vulture before. He didn't quite know what to do with it once he caught it. And I don't know what that would taste like, but I suppose if you're hungry... That would have to do, wouldn't it? Very good. Well, we're going to move on down here, heading on back towards, <laughs> back towards seeing if we can find the new den site. We did pass the old den site before. There's absolutely nothing going on. Jonathan, you want to know why they move their heads like that? I mean, if you've ever seen cows or horses moving towards water, or when they get excited about something, they thrash their head up and down. Uh, the exact reason, I, I couldn't tell you, to be honest, but I think a lot of it's got to do with excitement. There must be some mood towards it. I mean, a lot of the behavior of these animals is body language. Um, for example, when that, that male's walking with his head up, can you see he's showing quite a dominant sort of look. His tail is out. I think he's actually having a toilet stop there. But he makes himself look quite big, and he's also looking down his nose. The others, when they sort of move in their head, it's kind of an excited sort of motion. Uh, probably the other animals can pick up on what he's trying to do or trying to say. But obviously the movement is very obvious, and it's quite easy to see by another animal. You see, as I said, horses do it. Cows, when they get very excited, buffalo thrash their head from side to side as a sort of sort of aggressive behavior. So maybe the topi going up and down is a little bit about sort of the aggression. Wildebeest do something quite similar as well. Okay, everybody, well, we're going to move on towards the river, towards the possible new den of the North Clan. In the meantime, let's go back down to Ben Coley in Juma. Hello, everybody. Well, look what we've managed to find you. Um, somehow we managed to spot him on the way past. Craig actually saw movement. Uh, obviously, we disturbed him, and then he's bolted back to his little burrow here. This looks, although it is rather tricky to see, it looks like what is called a rough-scaled plated lizard. We get various plated lizards that could occur out here. The most famous and most often seen of them is the giant plated lizard because of its size. But they are normally associated with rocky habitats and they like to live in the crevices under rocks, uh, in between rocks. And you'll often see them early in the morning, especially sunbathing, being a reptile, trying to warm themselves up um, in the sunlight in the mornings. Um, 
But this one is in an old termite mound, or a huge termite mound, I should say, for that matter. And he's got himself a little retreat, and he's just watching us carefully from the safety of his little burrow. So it's very difficult for me to uh, say unequivocally that this is a rough-scaled plated lizard, but this is their preferred habitat. They are often associated with these termitaria, uh, which is the proper name for a termite mound. Uh, and they live uh, pretty much in relative harmony with the termites, I believe. Um, whether or not this mound is active is hard to say. It's such a huge mound that I can't really see any evidence of whether it has been, um, has been in use recently. But you can see this is a perfect little bolt hole for, uh, for an animal here that has got to keep an eye out for its predators, which for something like a plated lizard of, of this side, if we could see all of him from tip of the snout to the end of the tail, I would probably think he's around 30 centimeters if, it's, if he's fully grown. Um, and he's called a rough scaled plated lizard because the scales are sort of keels. They've got um, ridges all over them, which is probably just an adaptation for defense, like wearing a, a suit of armor, basically. But he'll be on the lookout for predators such as little raptors and uh, maybe even things like snakes. But this is just a perfect example of how uh, nature has this way of accommodating everybody quite literally in this case an old termite mound has got lots of little holes especially if erosion has taken place because a termite mound if it is active shouldn't really have any holes in it for the what we call the large fungus growing termites because it's very important for them to regulate their temperature so if you found an active termite mound and you accidentally put a hole in it you'll probably find that by the next day that hole will have been patched up because of their very sophisticated air conditioning system that they have going on there. If you leave a window open and you've got an aircon running, or I'm sure you guys will know that um, it rather uh, negates the point of having the aircon in the first place. So these termites are pretty uh, fastidious when it comes to looking after... Ooh, I don't know if you can hear that noise. That is a, uh, a lilac-breasted roller that was calling... So the um, so lots of other things will live inside these termites mounds. Um, everything from these plated lizards to the dwarf mongoose that you guys are um, enjoying some great sightings of lately, all the way up to things like uh, warthogs and hyenas that will use act, uh, disactive dens, uh, usually after an aardvark has dug the original hole. Um, I had a question, I'm sorry, I didn't catch the name, I was far too busy talking, um, but about whether a leopard would dig it up. Um, no, to be honest, this, that would be a lot of effort for a leopard to... Colleen, sorry, it was from Colleen. Colleen, my apologies. Um, no, I don't think a leopard would go through the, uh, the, the expenditure of energy to dig out a little lizard, which is not going to give it a huge amount of uh, energy in terms of what he, would, he or she would have had to expend to get it out. Um, however, certainly if uh, you know, we saw Tingana the other afternoon, he disappeared completely into an old termite mound or an old burrow into a termite mound for a couple of minutes, maybe trying to sniff out some, uh, some warthogs or maybe an aardvark or a civet or a porcupine. Um, but as I said, you never really know who's going to be home in one of these termite mounds. Lions are also known to dig into termite mounds to, to get to porcupines and things, but no, I don't think a leopard would, uh, would go through the effort of digging in just to get that. And this thing is so quick, it would re retreat far into the termite mound. If he happened to be walking down the road and one was unfortunate enough to, to flit across the road in front of the leopard, then I have no doubt it would do. The leopard's very adaptable and has a, a very varied diet. So it's not a question of not wanting to, to eat it. They'd be quite happy to eat it. But it's a lot of effort for a little reward. Nice to see you here. A lot of people probably uh, mistake this from a snake as they were to walk past. Uh, Faisal, you're asking why reptiles stay still for so long. Well, it's probably just to save energy. Being cold-blooded, although that's not really the correct term, the correct term would be ectothermic, which, uh, what it means, they don't actually have cold blood. If you were to cut one open and fill the blood, you wouldn't, uh, it's not icy to the fingers or icy to the touch at all. What it means is it's unable to control its body temperature, so it needs outside stimuli to, to warm up or to cool down. So that's why you see reptiles lying in the sunlight. They need to get their body temperature up to uh, enough temperature so that they can function and move around. Um, and they are potentially, if they are active during the evening, of course, then they are going to have to sort of call on those energy reserves that they've picked up during the day. So 
uh, rather not expend too much energy if you don't have to because for something like a, a lizard or a snake if it was to have to escape a predator and move very very quickly that burns a lot of energy uh, and they will become tired very very quickly and they'll have to sort of warm themselves up again Okay. Well, I think what we'll do, we're going to leave this little fellow, or it may be a fellowess, if that's the right word. We're going to, to leave her, and we're going to carry on now up towards Buffelsog Dam, my original plan, so the northeastern corner of the property, and see what our two hippos are up to, and see if anything else is coming down for a drink on this warm afternoon. In the meantime, I'm going to send you back to Trishala, who's got something rather special to show you located the lions and thankfully it was with the help of Ian because I was actually looking on the wrong side of the road. Sometimes it comes down to the simple things <laughs> when it comes to tracking and I had actually seen the track that took them from the other block into this block not realizing that where Ian had them this morning was actually where the tracks were going. I thought they had left so I'm pretty glad that we've caught up with them and there's some not so stressed out looking in parlor, not too far away that we passed on our way in here. So everyone seems to be having a very chilled day today. Especially these two. They were cuddling just now before the gremlins got me. Now they've decided it's too hot. So it looks like we've got five of them here but there may be others sort of lying up in the in the brown grass now you'll see when the grass is really brown like this and you'll notice the color is really very similar to the brownness of the grass and sometimes it can be very hard to see them especially if they're lying down that's all you'll find really often when it's really green Although it can be quite dense, it can be easier to see them against the very dark green. But other times, when it's sort of in the middle, it can be quite difficult. Everyone must be absolutely finished from their massive meal for the last couple of days. Sleepy and totally satisfied. Nikki, you'd like to know how many males and females are typically in a pride? Well, let's first explain pride dynamics to you and maybe that will answer your question. The pride consists of females and their offspring and they sort of stay in their pride as females would and the males will leave their pride at sort of three to four, they should be out. And then they will form a coalition and a coalition will usually be of brothers, inverted commas, because they're usually just animals that are associated within the pride and have brought up, been brought up together. For example, in this pride, we have the sub-adult male, who is the only male in the pride, but the Mangani male joined. So it is likely, even though they are not brothers, it is likely that they would form a coalition on their own. So you get the coalition males, which would be the males that own the pride of females and their offspring. And then you'd get the males that are within the pride who are sub-adults. So over here, with the Inkahumas and Avoka situation, we're looking at five males altogether, the Mangani male, the Inkahuma male, and the three Avokas. So it's hard to tell exactly how many, uh, how many of each sex there would be in a pride. It would obviously depend on the offspring, and of course how many coalition members there are amongst the males. Pride dynamics can be quite an interesting thing, especially when males start to leave, or if you look at the way, like when the evokers come in, when the evokers come in, you'll see that the males that are within the pride kind of try to keep their distance because they don't want to be pushed away. Debbie, you say what? how nice to actually have to see these in Kahumas after such a long time and for so many drives. Of course, it's wonderful. I haven't seen them in a while and I especially haven't seen those Avoca males. And they are some, somewhat my one of my favorite things. I can't pick favorites. You all know this. But one of my favorite things 
is to see them. Especially yesterday, I had an awesome time with them at the carcass. I hope they'll still be roaming around. But these guys seem really relaxed and... But the rest of them are not here, so perhaps there's others that are out. Maybe mating is still continuing, but it has been a fair few days now. I'm actually really looking forward to the possibility of cubs within our pride here at Juma. And I think it'll be an exciting next few months, especially if Tandi is also carrying a little one. This will be very exciting for the next few weeks. Now these guys, they've obviously just started mating, or as far as we've observed, they've just started mating. So we could only probably expect cubs in about three, three and a half months. So we're not really looking at immediate satisfaction. But with Tandi, we don't know. She might just, we don't even know she was already given birth, really. She could have found herself a nice den. But that would just be too cute. She's a shame, because I go and leave in a week. Don't want to miss that. So I hope she does give birth before that. Even so, we won't even be able to see them at this point. They'd be too tiny. Jonathan, you'd like to know why the Avoca males to tolerate the the two younger males. Well, firstly, the Mangani male, that's an interesting one. But like I said earlier, they, send, they tend to have been um, gone for most of the time that the Avoca males were here. Whereas when the when they're just sort of feeding and the evoker males are not around, they don't seem to have a problem. So obviously they know that their time is, is limited here with us and the Inkahumas. So they kind of get that sense. So I have the feeling that the evokers have not actually truly come to heads with them yet. And when they do, they will probably definitely, I say probably definitely, probably chase them out. It is about time, I reckon. Especially with the Mangani male, it's quite surprising that they've been so accepting of them. But they, they would avoid those of Ocas, like the plague, especially when they know what lies ahead of them. Well, my sleeping cats are definitely not going anywhere. In fact, if they could sink further into the ground, I'm sure they would. But Steve has also got a sleepy animal. So let's go over to him up in the Masai Mara. <laughs> Thank you, Trish. Well, we've managed to find one of the satellite dens now of what Archie tells me is indeed the North Clan. Uh, we've got one individual to our right that's having a bit of a nap in the shade. And I just spotted this one coming from the distance, uh, from the direction of Serena Airstrip, where Archie also says that the other den is. So it seems like they are time sharing between the two, um, but I do not. And I'm going to tell you right now, categorically, I have just figured out how to identify the five adult females of the Druma clan. So I'm going to need a little bit of help with the identification of these individuals. As I said, my phone is not working because of the Wi-Fi, so I can't even cheat and ask the hyena project. I can't even message Jamie to get some inside information. So I'm going to have to rely on, on you, the viewers, who know your hyenas very, very well. And that one's got a little bit of a nick out of the top right of the ear. From the size of it, it seems to be a youngster, but I don't know for now. They are so much more shaggy in their coat up here than they are down in South Africa. And the flies are very annoying around here at the moment. And we must be near a hyena den. So, Murray, correct me if I'm wrong, but did you say that the rest of the Unkuhuma Pride is there with those males? So the two young males in the Unkuhuma Pride are there with the evoker males. I, 
I think that is very interesting if indeed that is the case. This individual is coming closer. I've got a feeling that it does come right up to the den. This other one who's sleeping next to us, who'll show you shortly. She's also got a very characteristic ear. There might be some greeting ceremony that happens. But this one coming here is probably going, what is this big green thing doing in front of my den? Nice to see her moving or it's moving this time of day. A little bit of a breeze that's picked up that is definitely taking the heat off the air. She seems a little bit tentative coming closer. Don't be worried. We don't bite. Oh, face is covered in flies. I know the feeling. It's going to come closer. We do have this other individual to my right. Here we go. It's coming now. Look at that ear. That left ear has even got a little piece hanging off. That's a very characteristic ear, isn't it? Although that will change. Nikki, you want to know if females have got more testosterone? That seems to be what they've decided uh, through genetic sort of studies. Um, but if the matriarch, generally her offspring will have more testosterone than that of others. So she also passes on more testosterone to her son as she does to her daughter. But they reckon in the womb, the females generally get a little bit more testosterone, which is what leads to them being bigger. But I don't think for the most part, it is always the norm that always females are much, much bigger. I think a lot of the social standing and the production of sort of milk and sort of the gestation period from the mum itself enables an individual to get much bigger as well. So a lot of that's got to do with their birthing and who mum is. There we go. You can see the two of them now. We've got one with the right nick in the ear and the one on the left with a very dangly piece. The one on the left seems very small. Well, not very small, but small for hyena, but it's definitely a female. I can tell that because it's got mammary glands. Um, and maybe just a young female there we go you can see the one on the floor is also a female i thought so anyway she didn't even stand up to to do a proper greeting males aren't normally tolerated around dens although they are very inquisitive they do want to come and hang out and find out what's going on with the youngsters but it doesn't mean that they're tolerated but you see so she's that one lying down is much bigger than the one who just joined so that whole theory of you see the size is the way to determine male and female is not always the case these days. As I said, a lot of it's got to do with their upbringing and what happens to them in their early stages, especially in the development in the womb. But there's so much about hyenas that we're still learning today, it's still um, making it making known new information. Um, for example, females don't only don't inherit always the rank of the female that they're born to. They can sometimes jump above that to be caused by their own behavior and their own sort of way with the world. I know Waffles was a low ranking, born to a low ranking female and she managed to punch her way up the food chain, as it were. Although she did lose her place as well. Well, it's not very exciting around the den at this moment. It is probably going to heat up a bit with action and activity as it, um, as it sort of cools down a bit. And Brenda, you want to know if a male would kill the cubs in the hyena clan? And I don't know. I mean, it's not something I've ever heard of. Um, they don't really have the, the, the status to get close enough. Uh, there's generally always someone around watching, but I don't think it's unheard of, but I've never heard of it myself. I've never heard of a male hyena coming and killing cubs. Um, maybe, you know, I don't know. I've never heard of that before. 
But like I say, there are new things coming forward all the time. And from an evolutionary point of view, there's a reason why male lions and male leopards kill cubs, and that's to improve their dominance and their genetic strains going forward. Whereas a hyena in a clan, um, do you generally get sort of the females will choose um, in it, in what's the word males that have migrated in they'll choose them over local males who will generally have the lowest rank and they generally move away to try and get mating rights so it would sort of make sense i suppose for a male to kill cubs that weren't his so as to try and mate with females and sort of get his genetic line going but it's not something i've heard of we've never heard of infanticide in hyenas i definitely heard of canism when in within the the, the den it's been known i've never heard seen it physically but it's been told or researched that sometimes the offspring will kill each other a dominant one will kill a smaller one when they are very very small well animals that are very intriguing hyena there's no more intriguing or excitable couple in the world than scuba steve and snorkel sarah Hello everybody, well, we are at Buffles Hook Dam and it seems that we only have one hippo with us. Um, I think this is probably uh, Snorkel Sarah, um, purely, but it is rather difficult to sex hippos just from looking at the, the top of their heads. And as you can see, this one has now even sunk its muzzle into the ground, although she did have her head up. Oh, here we go. But you can see a little bit of pink around the eyes. That's often associated with females rather than males, although it should be considered a rule of thumb only as, a, as opposed to a, a hard and fast rule. Um, and then you can also look at the width uh, sort of across the muzzle, the larger ones generally being the males, narrower females. But without having two next to each other to compare, it's rather difficult. But my gut would suggest that this is uh, Snorkel Sarah. Scuba Steve, I'm not sure what's happened to him. He is possibly off snorkeling somewhere. Or maybe he's got so upset with being labelled one of the most boring hippos in the Sabi Sands. He went off gallivanting last night and is proving a point. That's also a possibility. But as you can see, I think Sarah's got a little bit camera shy. But the other thing I wanted to show you whilst we are sitting at the dam, because uh, I've been up here a couple of times and we haven't seen much activity from these hippos, is just on the other side of the dam, we have got a large tree and in it we can see a sort of a, a collection of matted stick nests i think if we can just pick it up on the camera you can see on the bottom left hand side perhaps that sort of um little mass in the bottom left hand corner of the tree is a red billed buffalo weaver nest there we go now we can see it nicely it's a rather untidy looking nest certainly not that traditional cup shape or platform nest that we often see and that is very large to give you an idea of scale that is probably two meters wide by at least a meter tall so it's not one bird that has made that massive nest although we do have the bird called the hammerkop over here which is an afrikaans word for hammerhead due to the shape of its head they make enormous nests bigger than that and just on their own but this has been made by a little colony of red-billed buffalo weavers so they are one of the small five and because of the name buffalo along with an elephant shrew a rhino beetle um, what else have I got? A leopard tortoise, an ant lion, and which one haven't I said? Elephant lion. I think that's all of them. That's fine. Um, so what's going on in there? Well, we're not quite sure because red bull buffalo weavers have a quite a complex social structure and breeding system. We've got two options as to what's going on in there. We've either got um, a cooperative breed, breeding group of birds, which normally means one alpha male and one alpha female, and then a bunch of helpers that all work together to try and ensure that the, the alpha pairs' chicks are raised successfully. And often those um, helpers are chicks or the clutch from a previous brood who are hanging around for a little bit longer than normal and helping mum and dad basically to ensure that their brothers and sisters are able to survive because as I said this morning for those of you who are watching you share more um, sorry yesterday more uh, yesterday afternoon you share more uh, genetic information with your brothers and sisters than you do with anybody else so it's, it's all about passing on your genetics the other alternative is that we might have a, a colony of them in there and within that big nest we've got um, we've we've got uh, lots of little 
uh, sections of the nest, little chambers if you like, and uh, might be a couple of males in there, and one male will have maybe five or six chambers with females, and another male only two or three, depending on that dominance hierarchy. So very difficult to know for sure, it's a very complex breeding behavior. But speaking of little ones, it's just very quick, we can always come back and talk a bit more about uh, buffalo weavers, but we're gonna quickly send you back up to Steve, because I think he has got some little ones of his own to show you. Well, everybody, that young female that came around the den, we went onto the other side to see maybe someone would pop out to say hello and look what's happened. Got three youngsters and another adult arrived with the biggest belly I've ever seen in my life. Look at that belly. It's about as full as it gets. Now, she's been lying up in a wallow somewhere in some water, keeping nice and dry. But as she approached, the, the cubs went straight underground, two of them, and then this little youngster came out, obviously knowing mum was here, could smell her waft as she arrived, got very excited, and started trying to attack her mammary glands. And she is yet to lie down to provide her with some milk. There we go. He's going to lie down on the nice open sandy patch. And there we go. Look at that. That's a prime real estate for a young hyena cub even provided with a little bit of shade from mum. This little youngster's going, hang on, I don't normally go that far away from the den. That's frightening. I think the two, that one there with the second one, are this female's cubs. And the bigger one on our left seems to only have one at the moment. We'll see. Oh, the jackal has just materialised at the back of the den there, Archie. Jackal's coming to investigate. Let's see how the hyena play with a jackal. A jackal would easily be able to kill. There's a second one coming also from the left. A jackal would easily be able to kill a hyena cub. I don't know if it's something that they do, but maybe they are coming to investigate whether the hyenas have brought any scraps back. They no doubt managed to, to scavenge off some of the bones and parts of meat that that's left behind sometimes when a high-ranking female brings bits and pieces back to the den. Jackal, bearing in mind everybody, will also use holes in the ground just like this. But I've never known of them doing it at the same time. Okay, well there, that's clearly mum with her two babies. And the other female, is, I thought had two, but it's hard to tell. They're all very much the same size. Well, that's the way it works out here. Yeah? The patience game, you just have to arrive somewhere and then wait. And we arrived and this side of the den was completely devoid of hyenas. We decided before we left, let's just check the shade on the other side. And that's when we found the female with a big chunk out of it. Yeah. And this female arrived, which produced the cubs. And then the world's fattest hyena arrived as well. And then they produced two more. They're very, very good. I wonder if anyone out there has heard, ever heard of a hyena cub being preyed upon by a jackal? I mean, I don't think it's unheard of. There's a little bit of squabbling going on here for the right to the best position under mum's belly. And the one on the left has got the best spot. It starts early with hyenas. I spoke about canism earlier. If you've never heard the term before, canism basically also refers to something called siblicide. Siblicide meaning a sibling killing another sibling and canism just being sort of a der der derivation of Cain and Abel in the Bible. And obviously Cain killed his brother. So that's been portrayed onto the animal kingdom. So hyenas are known to do it. Many of your large raptor species are known as well. It's a form of competition, direct competition. But I've never seen it in hyenas, but it is well documented. Here we go. I'm going to lie on your face. <laughs> uh oh, they're getting feisty. Mum's going to say, come on, behave yourself, children. It's a beautiful open area. The jackal is just on the right over here. It's busy scent marking right next to the den site, which is quite interesting. 
don't think he's going to... There doesn't seem to be any negative behaviour between the jackal and the hyena. The hyenas haven't even looked twice at him. I think they might just be trying to scratch up anything that the hyenas moved down. Because essentially they've come from the same direction where this very large, round female arrived from. So maybe they thought she was going to regurgitate some food and they'd be able to pick up on some of that meat. But jackals don't read the books. The books, jackals will tell you, the hyenas don't regurgitate food like you do for your offspring. Maybe they thought they would try their luck. They were very opportunistic. Uh, here, the first female we saw has come around and it looks like she wants a bit of the milk as well. She's probably just smelling that other female and going, where have you been? she got quite a belly on her herself. Her tunned belly. <laughs> where are you going? Are you going to go get yourself... Oh, you're just going to lie right there. Okay. <laughs> Priceless, Linda. It is... I mean, I don't know how many vehicles these um, youngsters see because they were a little bit nervous when they saw us. But uh, they then looked at mum and mum wasn't too concerned. And so then they just settled down. It's the classic case of habituation, everybody. You know, we spend a lot of time with wild animals and a lot of you might wonder how we get so close to some of them. And a lot of it's got to do with habituation. I know a lot of you probably heard the term before and you've had it detailed to you at length. But many of the viewers might be new and might not have heard or understood habituation. And habituation by no means, folks, means that the animals are tame. It just means that they get used to this big metal box that smells of diesel and the sounds of my voice and all those sorts of things. And essentially, once an adult is habituated, which sometimes takes a lot of effort in adults, especially leopard and lion, once they are habituated, their offspring don't react to any sort of negative behavior. They don't react to a vehicle because they look at mum, they feel a bit tentative, a bit worried they're gonna run away and they look at mum and she's lying down, relaxed, completely at ease, which means they calm down very quickly. So the habituation of cubs, of habituated animals is far, far quicker and easier than that of adults. And that's why when we find skittish adult leopards, very, very hard to habituate them very very hard indeed You've got to keep up with them follow them teach them that there's no negative response no negative um, reinforcer that comes from whatever's going on and they eventually get habituated and conditioned to the fact that well there's no negative behavior happening well, we were on the search for lions this afternoon and we weren't able to find their we know pride. We have now found a portion of the North Clan. I'm going to try wrap my head around them, but Trish has found lions and they are lying down very flat. Say again? I say he's dug it pretty deep. Mm. Now and he's doing the opposite. Now I heard that there was a buffalo. Don't know if I believe it. No, I do believe it because it came through Game Drive Radio that there's a buffalo in the pan outside the den. So I'm quite keen to see to see that. And I know that these guys will just be lying here for most of the day because they are so tired and it is really hot. But they found themselves a nice patch. Where are you going? Oh, you've just looked for another patch, have you? <laughs> They spend almost 20 to 21 hours just sort of um, not doing much at all, just chilling. I think that's quite the life. Now, if you can listen, hopefully they'll do it again. The group of Impala I told you about that's around the corner, they've been alarming. bit of snorts going on there. A 
Eddie, you'd like to know how many hours a day lions sleep? Like I said, they'd probably rest about 20 to 21 hours. Oh, possibly about 18, obviously, give or take a few hours. But the majority of the day is spent lying around and resting. These impala are going crazy. They, I'm surprised that they've only noticed the lions now, unless it's the same Unless it's the same um, impalas that are snorting at the same lions because they've been here for the whole day. Look at that heavy breathing, heavy breathing. All that meat has to digest. You see, they don't look too fat and rotund at the moment, so they've spent the last couple of days digesting all that they had gorged themselves on. Arizona, you'd like to know how much meat a lion can eat? Well, they can eat a lot of meat. When you think of a female lion, that's about 135 to 150 kgs. And you think of a male lion, that's about 200 kgs. Give or take, obviously, these are just estimates. They can eat a quarter of their body weight. And the maximum, maximum recorded, that is, of eating is about 40, 43, early 40s in terms of weight, 40 kgs or so, give or take, that a male lion has been seen eating, a female slightly less than that, probably about 27 to 30 kgs that it will eat in one sitting. And that is a lot. That is a lot. Can you imagine eating one quarter of your weight in one sitting? I can't imagine that. Oh. It's like her head is moving a little bit. As if she's dreaming. How cute. Ears are flicking. So. Like I said, they're not going anywhere. So I will return here very shortly and I'm going to visit the den and see if we can find that buffalo, which would be absolutely awesome. In the meantime, let me send you over to Ben, who has a pretty bud. Hi everybody, well, welcome back. Um, I was in the middle of telling you about the Red Bull Buffalo Weavers just now before Steve's hyena cubs popped their head out. And uh, um, Obviously we had to cut away to show you that. I'm sure that was lovely for you guys. But since I was telling you about Buffalo Weavers, I thought I might as well show you a picture of one because I can't actually see any around the nest at the moment. But you can see where the name Red Bull comes from, quite where the buffalo part comes from. I couldn't really tell you, but it's a reasonable sized bird, a bit larger than the other weavers, if, uh, if you guys know what they look like. So probably around about the size of a thrush I suppose if that helps you guys but that's that is the red billed buffalo weaver the ones responsible oh, sorry I dropped my phone the ones responsible for making those nests um, but there's one other thing I wanted to point out about those nests um, because they can actually help you in terms of survival out here if you get lost and you get stuck um, they are what or can be used as what are known as natural indicators. Out in this area in the Lofelt, so the eastern side of South Africa, nine times out of ten you are going to find these matted stick nests, these buffalo weavers nests, on the northwestern side of the tree. Um, we've got the sun behind us now, uh, and this one is indeed in the northwestern side of the tree. And there's been a lot of theories as to why they are always on that side of the tree. It can't be coincidental because it happens all the time. Um, and if it was for heat, you'd think they'd probably be on the uh, on the eastern side because the afternoon sun generally is a little bit hotter and the, uh, has had more time to warm up the, the sort of surrounding area and the ambient temperature. So what we now think is that actually our prevailing winds generally come from the east. They come off the Indian Ocean. Um, and the currents that flow down from the equator and then they flow inland towards South Africa 
and that's what drives our weather systems. It drives that moist air from the Indian Ocean up those little Drachensberg mountains, which are way off on our western side, and uh, and that then once that uh, sort of moist air, that humid air rises, it forms cloud. So the prevailing winds come off these from the southeast, um, and therefore the buffalo weavers build their nest on the northwestern side so that they can use those trees in order to uh, protect them from the wind, because obviously you don't want, with all these uh, rather loose sticks, you can see it's not the most um, well-built nest that you've ever seen, and too much wind might cause, obviously, parts of the nest to fall away. So that's why we think on the northwestern side. So that's one of many natural indicators that can be used to, to potentially orientate yourself and it's very easy to do especially on a cloudy day um, I remember doing a walk in a reserve not too far from here a little while ago and we were rather embarrassingly doing a navigation and orientation walk and I managed to walk over my own tracks at one point so I'd managed to walk in a complete circle uh, but it was very very cloudy that day and when all the bush looks very very similar if you're not paying proper attention it's very easy to get yourself turned around Okay, so I'm glad I got a chance to, to finish off my little buffalo weaver story for you. Um, I was going to show you a little bit more of the solitary hippo that we've got, but not much happening. Um, I see a lot of people asking or commenting on how low the water is already at this time of year, which certainly is a concern, but you can see there's still enough there that the hippo is able to completely submerge himself. You can just see a tiny portion of its back there. Um, but with winter fast approaching, which is our dry season, then yes, there is a good chance, unless we get some, some late rains, which obviously we're crossing our fingers for, that this waterhole may dry up uh, in the coming months. Now, that obviously is going to be potentially a problem for the hippos, but hippos are able to survive outside of water, so long as they stick to the shady spots, um, and they will try and migrate to another watering area. Obviously, it's a bit easier potentially for a female to be accepted into another pod than an adult male. He's the one who's going to have the difficulties. Oh, just popped its head up. Um, so yes, they, they are able to deal with a little bit of sunlight. Uh, hippos can't sweat, but they do produce uh, something called, which is sort of colloquially called blood sweat. Its proper name is hipposuric acid, and that is actually a secretion from a gland within that very, 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 very thick skin. Um, and it, when it sort of uh, comes into contact with the air, it oxidizes, if you like, and turns this pinkish color, which has led a lot of people uh, to, to believe that they do sweat blood. But if you see a hippo lying outside the water that's very, very pink, it's not so much sunburnt as such as it is that uh, special secretion, which is acting in the same manner as a sunblock, just uh, coating the skin and keeping it moist so it doesn't crack and, and dry. And it's also very, very rich in antibacterial properties, which is important for hippos, especially during the dry season because in a larger uh, area somewhere like Chitwa Dam where you've got lots of hippos there uh, there'll be a, a dominant bull and there's a little harem of females uh, and when uh, space and water starts to become at a premium uh, due to things drying up they do squabble a lot with each other and they slash at each other with those huge canine teeth uh, and can cause some rather nasty damage and you can see the state of this water it's rather fetid there's lots of what is probably the hippo's own dung floating around in here and algae beginning to grow and it's it's we certainly would not want to go swimming in there or drink that um, but that hipposuric acid is able to sort of uh, coat the skin and act like an antibacterial. And you, I have never seen in well, 13 or 14 years now of watching hippos, I have never seen a hippo with a, with a festering or a sort of a pussy infected wound. So it's very, very effective. Okay, let's send you back up to the Mara in the meantime and see what Steve's hyenas are up to. And we are going to head a little bit further south back towards where Tundi was last seen and see if we can find her for you guys. Welcome back everybody. I'm now with the hyena cubs once again and um, I've got some identification of the three females that we have seen because um, I asked for help didn't I? I called out my lifeline and lo and behold the Michigan State University arrived and not one but two vehicles. So this female here, who put the two darkest cubs, is called Polar Bear. Very interesting, the hierarchy and the naming of all of these animals. Don't, please don't ask me to get into it now, because I really still don't fully understand it all. And the individual we saw, you know, the small female that we saw, the little youngsters practicing pasting, 
and then that individual there is called Ink, who apparently is about eight or nine years old, so by no means a young hyena. She's been around the block with at least four sets of offspring before this one. She's the one with that neck in the left ear. And then the other female we saw with a big chunk out of her right ear is in fact a sour. So there we go. We've gotten some first-hand information. And Ink has got one little cub there. Polar Bear's got two. We're coming back in for a suckle, snuggle suckle session. <laughs> Isn't that gorgeous? To be able to spend time in the wild, watching wild animals do exactly what it is that they do, is a very big privilege that we have. Roshni, they do look like teddy bears, don't they? They're very cute and very cuddly. Um, <laughs> I think they would be quite nice to, to snuggle in the bed, the little cubs, but not as they get older. As they get older, they become a little bit more smelly and foul, don't they? There you go, Polo, looking over your shoulder. Those two jackal moved off anyway. They didn't pose any threat. They didn't cause any damage or harm. You can see that individual with enlarged penis at the moment. It's very hard to sex a hyena when they're young, but um, it's doing some practicing pasting around the den. You see that classic typical pasting it's something that hyenas do to mark their territory and they do it on their boundaries of the territory and there's a little anal anal gland just below the bottom of of quite a number of animals in fact and what they do is they find a, a small stalk or stick they go over it in that very low sort of moving motion that you saw before and they leave a very smelly paste on there and obviously the youngsters practice it you can't go and be pasting out. There we go. Pasting out in the middle of the wilderness if you haven't practiced how to paste. And so they practice around the den. And then they go and they smell it as well to see. Oh, there we go. Paste it there already. Paste there again. And the adults do it on the periphery, on the boundaries of their territory. And apparently, the hyena can smell the paste. And they know all sorts of information is communicated through that chemical smell. Uh oh, something scared him. <laughs> I'm finding it difficult to understand if that is in fact mum or not mum. Because at first it was playing with ink and then it went to suckle. And hyenas aren't known to suckle the offspring of others. So I went to polar bear to suckle and I thought she was getting in there. But now she's looking more spotted like the individual that is with that, that hyena there. So very hard for me to actually tell you, everybody. I have to just spend more time here to find out. But uh, we're going to finish the segment. We're going to move off to see if we can find the other den. Because, um, because um, the Michigan State University have got a graduate student. They're looking to do a bit of an experiment here. And we can't be here for that because we're going to interfere. And I'll find out all about it and let you know exactly what experiment they are going to be doing. doing. Lots of studies, lots of research, lots of papers are coming out here. And the forefront of hyena research in the Mara most certainly is coming from this university. Donna, you want to know if that female was pregnant? And I really don't know. She looked very, very fat and bloated. Maybe she's also got cubs somewhere else. It's very hard to say. Anyway, we've got very cute cubs and hyenas in the open and Trishala has found one of the Juma clan lying in the mud. There's an impala drinking. Oh, we're here with June. <laughs> and she's decided to take a bit of a spa day or from the kids, not too far from the den, so she can still keep an ear out. But still enjoying a mud bath. Now, this brave impala, we saw him coming at a distance. And we thought he would make it the whole way, especially since after you saw the hyena. Now, look at him trying to investigate. Why won't you just stick to your side and have a drink instead? Nope, I want to come closer. June is just trying to enjoy her day off on being a mum. And this rutting impala with all his bravado is going to stuff it up for her a little bit. So she seems to not care at all. 
so cautiously stepping. Oh, that looks like it feels good, especially on a hot day like this. <laughs> that Impala is so curious, brave and scared at the same time. He just made a half-hearted bark and you could actually see the nose flaring which is quite nice you don't get to see it often you hear it so very often but when you see it actually flare it looks very cool you can see exactly where it's coming from <laughs> I see this so often and sometimes I wonder why don't you just leave Hyena can easily take on an impala. And they are they are avid hunters. So June's sort of disinterest in this impala probably has a lot more to do with her current mood. If her eyes even open. Her eyes are closed. She does not care. Mickey, you'd like to know if hyena characteristics are similar to domestic dogs. Well, hyenas are not related to dogs, or rather they're not in the same family as dogs, neither are they in the same as cats. They are in their own special group called hyena day and they exhibit particular characteristics to that group. Now if I remember correctly, their lineage is about 10 million years old. So they split from the groups, the group that civets belong to about 10 million years ago and that's when they branched off and then obviously you get the brown hyena, striped hyena, an odd wolf and of course the spotted hyena and from those the spotted hyena seems to have branched off most recently. So it's basically the most advanced version. And interestingly it appears that hyenas actually evolved or uh, got these, or spotted hyenas rather, got this trait of being really really vicious and carnivorous as opposed to the other hyenas are a little bit less seen in that light or rather these hyenas seem to be spotted hyenas seem to be stronger and much more tactful and it's actually might have been related to the fact that when they did split saber-toothed animals were still around and they couldn't capitalize on the bones and other parts of the meat that were inaccessible with those big canine teeth and then that's where hyenas came in and they were able to capitalize on what was left by all those animals and that's how that lineage kind of split. It's always really interesting because it everything kind of makes sense in light of evolution when you think about the different niches that had to be filled and different adaptations. Joy, you want to know if I think that, well, there's your, there's your answer. I will, June is definitely aware now. I'm sure she was aware even before. I mean, the, the Impala did give a small, a little bit of a bark. It wasn't a full one, an alarm call, but now she's definitely given it a look even. So I think she knew before that definitely something was there and she could smell the Impala. It's probably smelling quite strongly at the moment considering that he's look how cautious he is. Considering that he's it's around the time that he'll be territorial so he's spent less time taking care of himself. 
Oh, it's almost as if Jude wanted to make it me feel more comfortable by turning the other way. Like, no, oh, I'm not. I'm not going to get you. Don't you worry. Yeah, no, she's not. She's not interested in Mr. Impala at all. Well, then Pala's finally gotten his drink, so maybe he'll decide to move off now and stop showing off. Yes, you, you were showing off. Typical behavior, rubbing himself, his forehead, wherever he goes. Mina Moo, you'd like to know if hyenas are immune to insect bites. They are not immune in the sense that insects will not bother them. Insects will definitely bother them. But whether they get affected by sort of viruses that could be, could be carried in these insects, well, they actually have a very, very powerful immune system. And they seem to be unaffected by many things. I mean, they still get can still get rabies and other sorts of of problems but not they seem to have bred a really high um, immunity to a lot of these things and that's kind of credits their success a bit Like I explained earlier, when they split from the group and of the group that civets belong to, and they have shared that common ancestor, when that happened, it's from that time when they started to scavenge and bones and other types of rotting meat that they had actually began developing this and weeding out hyenas or individuals that didn't have the capacity to deal with infection and those that did. And those that did are the ones that survived and reproduced. And a lot of animals that eat carrion, I mean, hyenas, vultures, you'll find that the, the gastric juices act sort of like a filter. So any sort of insect or rotting meat that's been infected with something that they eat, they have the safety net of really powerful gastric juices that it kind of has to pass through first. And if it can make it through those, then I suppose it would infect the hyena, but if it can't, which most of them won't, then the hyena remains fairly healthy. This is actually a very nice calming scene. Honeybee, you'd like to know what those are floating close to the hyena. There's a few things. We've got some bobbing terrapin hens that seem, they remind me a little bit like a merry-go-round. They're all sort of moving. Or a game you'd find at a carnival. All these heads pop out and you hit the heads. And they're just moving across. So there's a whole heap of terrapin, but there's also little bits of vegetation and algae that's floating around as well. And that's typical because there's no real flow in this in this pan at all. Really, whatever gets caught by the rain stays there and it breeds quite a lot of life. You'll also find tiny little flowering plants that float around at the edges in little rafts. But the water's not looking in the best condition. Unfortunately, it'll probably only get worse. Joyce, you'd like to know what animals attack hyenas? Most often, animals attack hyenas in defense. Maybe they'd like to, um, 
hyena is stealing something and then a leopard would obviously attack it back or try to defend itself and even when it does that that's kind of happens quite rarely because they the leopard doesn't want to get bitten by the hyena and the hyena has a really really strong jaw that exerts a lot of force and not to say the teeth as well so the leopard doesn't want to get on the bad side of the hyena the hyena tends to be a little bit more brave because remember they've also got the backing up of the clan that they can call for what have you heard but hyenas and lions definitely don't seem to get along in my experience i've had one time where the elephants that we were with hated the hyenas that were around and was getting very very upset at all the hyenas that sort of were at their feet moving very fast and they seem to have lost control the elephants i'm talking about and then the elephant looked at us and decided well i can't get a hyena so i'm gonna run towards this vehicle instead sort of give a gave a little mock charge so i can tell you that when elephants are irritated they don't like hyenas there may be some conflict there but in that case the hyena is the one that's probably going to get badly injured then there's also lions and hyenas who definitely don't like each other and that's also because of predator hierarchy or the interaction between predators and the fact that they often steal kills from one another and they rely on similar resources so they're in direct comp competition so just the fact that one is around, even though you might not eat it, or the, the hyena might not eat the lion, or the lion will not eat the hyena, if they get the chance to eliminate individuals from that species, they will do that because it means it eliminates competition, extra competition. Now, Corky the matriarch was attacked by a lion, if you remember. It was quite an exciting thing. It was heart-wrenching i remember seeing it in the fc and because i wasn't out on drive that day and just thinking oh oh my gosh cocky please be okay please be okay and she was attacked by the dark main devoker in november last year so they definitely do have interactions with lots of animals but when they're in a pack when they're singly all that can change the dynamic Well, I'm going to leave June for her mud bath now and see somebody else who's got a mud bath going on. And that seems to be the buffalo. Hopefully he's still around the den where he was called in. So I'm going to go there now. In the meantime, let's go over to Ben, who's still looking for his leopard. Boys and girls, right, we are now officially on the hunt for Tundi. But as of yet, we've not had any good luck. Um, I was able to just chat to one of the other guys who was out this morning, Sydney, in fact, who was last with Tundi. And we've come to the area where she sort of disappeared from view this morning. And once I've finished with you guys now, what I'm going to do is just go for uh, a little scratch around and see if I can pick up any tracks and find a direction of where she went from this morning. This is actually uh, the same little road we access on this tree in front of us to the right here. Sorry, Craig. Uh, that is where Tundi had her kill a couple of nights ago which when I came to try and find her the next morning discovered that she was still not here and still hadn't touched anything and then Tristan picked up Tingana hoovering up what was left of the kill a couple of days later so she's still hanging around in this area uh, potentially as we said earlier looking for a den site but uh, well we'll cross fingers but we're not sure 110 percent yet um, so she was last seen coming up from Chele Pan and she, she crossed down into this drainage line and then as you can see it's a little bit thicker in front of us, very difficult for us to, to follow in the vehicle through here. So as I said, once I'm finished with you guys, I would love to take you with me, but unfortunately uh, Craig can't uncouple this rather fancy camera off the back of the car. I'm just going to go and have a look and see if I can pick up any of her tracks in this drainage line so we can get a vague idea of direction and then we know definitely which area to work in. Okay, in the meantime, I'm just trying to see what else is happening here. We've got, um, Craig, I don't know if you're able to swing far enough left to that tree with the, with the knobs on on the left just to show our viewers something whilst I'm here. I just want to show you this rather strange looking tree here. Can you see there all those unusual protrusions on the tree? 
But if we could get really, really close, you might be able to see that each of those little knobs does have a thorn on the end of it, which is why this tree is called an, um, a knob thorn, hence the name. Um, and since I mentioned something about survival for you earlier, I thought well, I might as well give you a little bit of bush medicine as well, just in case you are stuck out here. Now, knob thorns, like all of the well, what used to be called it, acacias. They're now Senegalias and Vichilias. The, the classification has changed dependent upon their uh, type of thorn that they have. Um, but as with all acacias, they're very, very rich in tannins. Now, tannin is that substance for, if those of you who've ever drunk too much red wine, which I'm sure is very few of you, no doubt, um, but you get that very dry taste at the back of your mouth, especially sort of later on in the evening, and it feels like all the moisture's been sucked out of your mouth. That is what tannins do, and that is... Uh, quite common amongst trees as a defense mechanism to stop over browsing. In fact, too much tannins can actually poison and even kill a browsing animal. So it sort of forces the animal to move on. But the tannin is also present in, uh, in these knobs on the tree as well. Um, and what the local people used to do is they would, there's <laughs> no easy way to say it, break off a knob and, and light it. And then if they had a nosebleed, they would then inhale that smoke uh, and that would stop the nosebleed. And it is quite effective. And it's probably because of the fact that those tannins are, are, are also burning and you're inhaling the tannins and you've got very, very thin mucous membranes in the inside of your nose. So those tannins sort of cause the capillaries to close up very, very quickly and stem the flow of bleeding. So obviously rather, if you, if you have no other option, rather just put your head back perhaps um, and do it the traditional way. But uh, that's the way the local people do it here. Then I suppose if that doesn't work, you can always bung your nose up with one of those knobs as well, if you needed to. Um, quite a lot on this tree. You often don't see lots of knobs on larger knob thorns. And that's probably just because of the energy that is expended to, to grow them in the first place. And... <clears throat> sorry, excuse me, to grow them in the first place and to keep them well nourished. Uh, they still need to be fed, as it were, from the nutrients being sucked up from the roots. Um, and it's there very much as a defense mechanism of the tree to hopefully stop it from being, for example, ring barked by elephants or to have the bark attacked. And we can actually see this one has not been very successful. Uh, it has been had a little bit of damage to it uh, lower down on the tree. You can just see there, Craig, zoom in. You can see it's lost some of the bark there. Oh. So there was just a Franklin calling in the background. So I'm obviously very much uh, listening for any clues as to Tundi's whereabouts. So we'll listen if that Franklin uh, says anything again. Okay, so with the bigger knob thorns, you often don't see the knobs. It's more prevalent on the, on the younger ones because obviously they are more vulnerable to being broken. A larger tree should be a, a lot more stable and doesn't need that extra protection. But with this being in a dry riverbed, it'll have access to underground water, even though there is no water visible on the surface. And one of the reasons these drainage lines become so heavily vegetated is because of the underlying water and therefore this tree has potentially got access to a little bit more minerals and moisture because it's sort of at the bottom of the slope so all of the minerals further up the slope have washed down and congregated in this area so that's why you generally see much bigger trees along watercourses which is another good way of course to help yourself if you do find yourself lost uh, if you can find a riverbed uh, and follow it downhill, that should eventually lead you to water, and generally people are associated with water as well. Okay, I think what we're going to do, guys, if you don't mind, I'm going to send you back up to Steve and his, and his hyenas in the Mara, and we are going to carry on our search for Tundi, and hopefully next time you come back to us, we will have some good news. Welcome back to the Mara, everybody. And we've moved from one hyena den location to what seems to be a second one and potentially even a new one. And what we have found, I know everyone's going to be very excited, it is Waffles with her two youngsters who uh, last I saw them were little babies. I can tell it's Waffles because it's got a collar on. I could be completely wrong though, but I think it is Waffles and her two youngsters. Um, I remember the one's name was Grenadine and the other one is slipping my mind now. It's a South African drink and I've completely forgotten what it's called. But um, anyway, maybe someone out there can remind me real quick on hashtag Safari Live. What is Waffles Other Cub's name? If you don't mind. And uh, well, what is exactly happening here? You can see they're lying up in a bit of a drainage culvert whereby there is a drainage pipe that goes under the road that we're on 
and uh, then obviously water comes out there and goes down the slope and obviously these culverts are designed to keep water off the road and uh, the hyenas are very well known to den inside them and Archie first brought us to a den just down the road which is another culvert and we got there it was completely inundated with water so we decided to come up the slope and see if maybe we would find them at a secondary one and well here we have found them indeed we stopped um, a vehicle on the side of the road a moment ago and we'd asked him if he'd seen anything. He said, nope, haven't seen anything. Just some hyenas. <laughs> People don't care about hyenas, do they? I, I quite enjoy them. I know all of you do. It's very special to see these little youngsters. They were born while I was here last time. Very fresh. And it's amazing. They've grown, but they're still suckling. Hello, age Shay. Hello, Shay, age twelve. What a very interesting question. You want to know if I've had any hyenas trying to eat my car? Well, I haven't yet. I left the Juma a few days ago, and uh, the last time one of them tried to eat my car was one of Pretty's little youngsters. Very naughty they are. At least we have a door on this vehicle, so at least if they come to eat the car, they've got no chance of grabbing my toes. So these are two, the first one we framed up in this one are two other youngsters. Uh, you can see that by the size and they're hanging around, no doubt waiting for their mum to return and to come provide them with milk. And I'm trying to remember who it was when I was here last. Um, Waffles had a, a pair of cubs and there was another female that was hanging out with her that had a pair as well that was slightly bigger at the time. But my memory escapes me. But I was chatting with the researchers about the information or the research that they're going to be doing. And they've got a grad student, as I said, who they're looking to do a study on the earliest age that the cubs respond to sort of the distress calls and the sounds that are given off at a kill site. For example, a buffalo or an impala or whatever it might be that like, that like bellow that is given off in distress and what we've proven what's not me personally but been proven very very well in the past and i have seen it with my own eyes if you play distress calls predators such as lion leopard and hyena are very well known to come towards that area and try and chase off whatever predator there might be at least to come and investigate what's going on so they've proven it to be a very very good means of attracting predators if you wanted to do a, a count of predator count in your area, you'd set up loudspeakers, uh, work out a sort of distance that you should position yourself so that you don't overlap, and then you move around your reserve, you blast those speakers with a buffalo dying or whatever it might be, and you count the predators that come in. And that's a very good way of, of identifying hyenas and lion. And so what they're going to do is they're going to try and investigate at what age do these youngsters start to respond to those distress calls and um, it is an interesting one I mean maybe these youngsters that are hanging around that are at least a little bit more sort of fluffy and bigger they might respond to some alarm calls uh, but would those small little baby cubs probably not they'd probably be quite afraid of it in fact they might go and hide in their hole but you don't know unless you try it there she goes now, if that is Waffles, she's definitely lost some size. She was a big girl last I saw her. And I don't know any other characteristic features apart from her necklace that she's wearing. She's had enough of suckling. She's not going to go get some food. No, nope, she's going to go lie down <laughs> in a dry patch. So there is another den around the corner next to the airstrip, the Serena airstrip. Apparently is also being used by this family. Minamu, that's a very interesting question. I really wouldn't be able to tell you, but obviously the den sites would have to fall within uh, sort of their territory. 
and they'll be looking for something that they can go underground with, essentially somewhere where the cubs can dig in a bit and be protected. Uh, obviously, down in Juma, we find very large termite mounds serve the purpose. Um, but then also up here in the Mara, we don't have the large den sites we have, or the large termite mounds. We've got much smaller termite mounds above the ground, but they are indeed quite large underneath the ground. So I don't know what would be the purpose or the exact selection criteria behind it. Um, it might be possibly an area that mum has used, so the daughter will utilize it, same as we've seen Tundi has used many of the den sites or den areas that Karula used and she's also used them time and time out, time and again. So wherever something has been successful, you've proven that the real estate is a good one, and the, they'll go back and use them again. Not uncommon for a den site to be used repeatedly, obviously after a few periods of sort of absence. Isn't that a very spotted little fellow? <laughs> oh, you can see, I think, I'm very not sure actually, they don't look very big. If that was Waffles, her cubs should be a lot bigger now, I would think. But uh, it's been, it's been what, five, six months since I've seen them? You'd think they'd be bigger than that. I'm going to have to really get back into grips with everything that's going up here. Hello, Mickey. Very interesting, but um, it's dependent on the status of the female. So hyenas have the potential to suckle for up to a year, the longest sort of for their body size in the mammal kingdom. But then also they can go seven, eight months. Uh, for example, a matriarch would have the potential of bringing food back to the den, uh, which means that her youngsters can stay at the den longer and get milk and stay safe. Uh, but a matriarch has the potential to bring food back, which will be eaten by her offspring. Any other individual bringing food back will just have it stolen, so her cubs generally will move earlier because they need to start getting some food, and it also puts them a bit of risk. So they do need a little bit of meat in their diet after a certain number of months, uh, but being the matriarch's daughter or son, they have the privilege of having food fully catered for. So anywhere from seven to eight months to a year, and obviously status depending, and maybe even the behavior or the attitude of the little individual might encourage them to go sooner in search of food with mum. They need to learn the hyena trade at some stage. They want something more than just milk. They're very nutrient rich milk, quite high in protein, good amount of fat, Hyenas are unique in that. They're able to obviously access lots and lots of bone in their diet. Oh, that's a beautiful stretch, Waffles. Beautiful stretch. And she's probably going to go find that old den we were talking about a moment ago where there's a bit of water. Go and quench her thirst. So those of you who might be new to the show, the collars are on there for a reason. There is a sort of the research program that's been going on in the Masai Mara for over 30 years, whereby they've been documenting the movement patterns and all sorts of other things with the hyenas. And the collar is a GPS collar, which it's got, I'm not 100% sure, but I think it's got a few years lifespan, maybe five years lifespan, and then it needs to be replaced or then maybe put on another individual. And what that GPS does is it's constantly sending a sort of signal out there which can be downloaded at any point and will give you all of the movements that that animal's gone through. Peak hours, distance covered, uh, obviously the entire route and also uh, area times of activity will be there. So speed and all sorts of things are recorded on these devices. And then also it allows the researchers to come out with a telemetry device to go and because the GPS, obviously, it's not immediate. It needs to be downloaded. But the telemetry device, you, you know, you've seen people standing on roofs with that little sort of pronged um, sort of antennae that they stand and they move around. With that, you can quite easily pinpoint where an animal is and they'll then be able to go and find it and then do observational studies. But all the while, that information is being uploaded to a cloud or whatever it might be and then they're able to extrapolate all that information and data on to many 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 different papers and informa whatever it is that they're trying to figure out and trying to do
The youngsters are left. The safety of the den. Well, the one adult moves off, possibly in search of some food or maybe for a little bit of a drink. Well, it seems like Ben is looking for Tandy. Trish is looking for hyenas. I've found my hyenas. I wonder if Trish is going to beat Hen, a Ben on the search. Well, I went down to the hyena den or the Juma den in one way used to. Let me actually get in through here. And there was nobody around and the buffalo was not around either. But you could definitely see where he was wallowing in the mud in there. You know the splash pool we always talk about in front? He seemed to have been sitting in there. But nobody was home. Now we're going to see the other den. I'm still trying to get used to this den. Getting around, finding the best position. And it's very thick around. So sometimes, yeah, Senzo's got it. I was just thinking to go around at the same time that his hand came around. So yeah, this one is a lot more bushy, a lot more stumps around. Definitely not as pretty as the other den. But it is better protected and it is much taller. It's actually like a double story den. We'll go as soon as I manage to get in properly. We can have a look. And it seems that nobody is home. Just careful here. we go. Right, anybody lying around? Hello? Nobody. Let's have a small drive around here. Hmm. Okay. Let's go back so I can at least show you the entrance. But there's no hyena friends around, unfortunately. Deborah, you'd like to know if hyenas hunt and kill or do they just scavenge? Well, there you've got a nice picture of the den, so let me answer this while we're looking at it hyenas are very skillful hunters very very skillful skillful hunt, hunters in areas of africa they can actually hunt up to 80 percent sometimes 90 percent of their own prey and when you think about the fact that they're constantly being put under the umbrella of scavengers it's not really correct in a place like this in kruger national park it's 50 percent at least that they hunt they actively hunt now off the hyena family they are the only ones that actively hunt these spotted hyenas and they are very very good at it that being said they're also very very good at scavenging and often an animal will scavenge if they a, have the capacity and ability to digest scavenged meat bones sinew um, meat that may be infected by something and also because it's easier why should i go and put an effort and energy into game drive radio going crazy why should i put effort and time into something that i'm going to catch and have to strategically do this when i can just bump a kill off a, a lion for example and lions feel the same way about hyenas and they often will steal each other's kills and sometimes even more often than not a lion will, will steal a kill from a hyena so very very interesting it's a shame that they got that reputation so you know sort of specifically people don't think or oh, maybe they could scavenge and hunt but it seems that they've just been put into that bracket of scavengers which is a shame because they are a lot more developed than that but alas it is empty so we will move on a little bit maybe we'll catch up with corky on the road or something like that but you can see that it's a nice double story one there's a entrance on the bottom floor 
<laughs> the top doesn't have a huge entrance, but it's not for everybody. You can see on the left, there's a few holes there, but they might actually not even join the tunnel on the inside. I would love to know what the inside of the den looks like. Any hyena den, really? All right. <laughs> Let us head off. I was hoping if I just stayed here a little longer, someone would come running, but no. I had a lot of action here last week, Sunday or Saturday. This is true. They will probably come out as soon as I leave. The winding steering wheel is so tight today. <laughs> Murray suggests that I, I should have taken the drone and then woke them all up. No, but that's not nice. Shame. But the cubs that I did see here at this particular den was Ribbon and her two cubs. As well as June and her two cubs. So her cubs are almost definitely in the den. while she has her well-deserved break. But it seems like the other den, the den, den that we used to, the one I just came from, seems to be occupied by Corky and Pretty more of the time. But the problem is, I should like to go out this way. The problem is you often see them at each other's dens. Well, guys, we will be back very, very soon, but thank you so much for joining. We're going to have a bit of a school session and hopefully have some really nice animals for them too. So thank you so much.